Today I'm going to talk about audience building in the age of platforms. And actually, we've been sharing data about platforms for about two or three years. Um, but it's only been in the last 60 days that I've changed the title of this presentation to audience building in a post-platform world. And this is significant because we're starting to see signs in some of the trends that we have in data that's showing that the, the defense of the duopoly, the power of the duopoly, is, um, is starting to change. So today I'd like to share some of this data with you and also talk about the implications this has for the media business. But before I do, I'd like to talk a little bit about Chartbeat. Uh, Chartbeat is the analytic system for newsrooms around the world. Um, and um, we measure real-time data. So we, we actually measure, uh, we have code on publisher sites around the world that helps them understand how content is being consumed in real time. Um, in, um, we work with over 50,000 sites, uh, which is made up of 700 enterprise customers. Um, in 65 countries. But we're also a research company. Because we work with so many companies around the world, uh, we're able to look at anonymized aggregate trends um, to help our customers understand how those trends impact their business. That gives us a really interesting perspective when it comes to platforms. Um, so today, I'm really going to um, talk to you about two key questions. Um, what is really happening in the age of platforms, and then also how can you use data uh, to grow your business? Okay, news has always captured the most significant moments. For the last generation, news was packaged and distributed by publishers and revered by consumers. The brand names were strong and readers were loyal. We also made news a habit. We read the paper, we watched news on television, um, and we watched it at specific times. And to certain people, news was an addiction, something you did every day, like drinking coffee. And news is still revered, but it has changed dramatically, particularly in how it's distributed. Having a strong digital strategy across desktop and mobile devices is now critically important. And this requires an understanding not only of your audience or the readers on your sites, but also of how traffic flows into your sites and into your apps from platforms and search engines. We live in a distributed content world, and understanding your business is no longer just about your sites. It's about knowing and understanding the media e ecosystem. What's really interesting is uh, this line. This represents, across all of Chartbeat sites, global demand for content. And we see about 15 billion page views a week. But why is this line flat? With everything we see going on in the world, all of the platform shifts that are happening that we hear about in the news, how is it that with the exception of uh, the Manchester terror event in May, um, or of the holiday season, the last week of December, that this line is practically flat. It's because there are so many shifts happening on the supply side, but demand from consumers for content is consistent. Underneath the surface, however, there are tectonic shifts happening on the supply side that we need to pay attention to. Let's take a look. In terms of worldwide traffic, how do visits from top traffic sources or referrals break down? What we really see is that there are four main sources of traffic. First is direct. Direct traffic is just shy of about 40%. Um, this means that people going directly to your sites, your mobile sites, or your apps makes up about 40% of traffic that's being driven to a publisher's site. Google is next in line, um, and that's just more than 20% followed by dark social, which represents traffic coming from messaging apps and email, um, followed by uh, sort of a, an, um, basically an everything else category. Um, in terms of Korea, uh, this is similar, but Naver and Kakao talk 
show up in the top referrer sources. It's critical to look at the traffic sources because 40% of traffic may be direct, but 60% of traffic coming into a publisher site at any point in time is being driven by sources that you can't control. And this is just further proof that we really do live in an ecosystem, and we need to understand how things flow, not just directly, but indirectly. One of the most significant shifts we've seen in the last 18 months globally, this is from our global data set, is the shift to mobile. Um, now, this may sound strange in Korea because you've been primarily mobile for a long time, but around the world, we've now seen that, that very talked about moment when mobile now has exceeded desktop. So any discussion of direct traffic these days has to consider the dynamics um, that happen on mobile. Okay, this is a pivotal moment. What we're seeing in this chart is that in about May, uh, mobile started to take over desktop in terms of the, the trend line. But what does mobile really mean? For most people in the West, mobile has been equated with social. Mobile just equals social. Mobile equaled Facebook. But now we're seeing that there's a much broader mobile ecosystem that's being built that we need to understand. And it's consisted, it consists not only of platforms like Google, Facebook, and Naver, but also of news aggregators. But what makes these news aggregators different is that they're now built into the mobile device um, in the mobile, in the operating system or in the browser. There's also been a return to mobile owned and operated power in the hands of publishers with the onset of push notifications, for example, um, and the fact that the reading of mobile apps is up year over year. Um, and this is um, giving us a much broader landscape in mobile that we have to pay attention to. But what's really critically interesting when we look at platforms, and that's that first bucket in the diagram, is that we're seeing that the, the traffic trends have completely reversed. Facebook, over the course of the last two years, is now down 40%. And Google Search, which primarily was driven on desktop, is now up 200% on mobile year over year. What's even more interesting is that Google search on mobile is now driving double the amount of referrer traffic than Facebook is to publishers' sites. This is just a huge surprise, and the reasons are all mobile. When you dig into why Google search is up, it's because AMP is up. Accelerated mobile pages, AMP, is the uh, standard that Google launched as an open source initiative that enables publishers to make their pages load faster. Um, it's because of this reason and other reasons that, go that and investments that Google is making in their mobile infrastructure that is really the key driver um, in this shift. The second category that we're going to look at is aggregators. Underneath the top three refer channels that I talked about earlier are refers number four to ten. At the very top is Twitter. At the very bottom is Instagram. What's starting to happen is that there's an emergence of a new class of mobile referrer. And this has been, this is brand new. This has just pretty much happened in the past year. And what we're seeing is that um, it's being driven by, very much by Google. Google Chrome suggestions, which is this blue line here, is now as large as Twitter in terms of driving traffic to publishers' sites around the world. And there are a number of factors at play here. Google, what is Google Chrome Suggestions? It's called Articles for You, and it's actually a personalization engine in Chrome. So if you, if you have an Android device and you open up a Google browser, 
uh, you'll see uh, uh, in the top right side a number of articles that are recommended for you. This is based on algorithm-driven news, um, and this is now the, uh, the fifth largest referrer of traffic um, since May 2017. In red here is also another news aggregator, Flipboard. Also up significantly. Why are they up? What's that driving force? They did a deal with Samsung. Flipboard is now a default news aggregator installed on Samsung phones in the Western world. Because of that, it's right on your screen when you pick up your phone. So that is now starting to drive a tremendous amount of traffic. What does that mean for Samsung? Does that now put pow more power? Are they really, or could they be one of the next major platforms? Back to Google. In addition to Google Chrome suggestions, Google News has taken off and it's increased by 3x um, very quickly since May. So in May, and prior to May, Google had two apps. They had Google News and they had Google Play Newsstand. They deprecated Google Play Newsstand and they merged the two um, and they relaunched Google News. Uh, in, in terms of their mobile strategy, uh, this, this was critical. Um, and now we're now seeing a huge lift in terms of the endemic traffic that is being driven from Android devices. So just stepping back a second, um, what we're really seeing here is this new type of platform that's emerging um, that, is, that is right on your mobile screen. Um, and um, what they have in common is that um, they're all built in to the mobile device. They're default browsers. Um, a few others that I'd like to mention, Upday. Upday is up 763%. This is also another app. This is built by Axel Springer and is now one of the top five referrer sources in Europe. And this is an interesting business model because this is representative of a group of publishers who've, or a publisher, Axel Springer, who has built a news aggregator model that enables other publishers to submit content. Um, but what's the reason for their success? Also a deal with Samsung. They're now default installed on EU-based phones um, that are Android. And finally, we have Apple News. We can't say what the increase is for Apple News, but it's extremely high, um, extremely dramatic. And um, it's also obviously the de the de a default operating system on Apple devices, uh, which is the primary device in the US. So what we're really seeing is um, a new portal emerge. Uh, and um, this left of screen on your mobile device is, uh, is something that we have to pay attention to. Okay, the last category I'd like to talk about is owned and operated, um, another critical part of the mobile ecosystem that we're seeing. Okay, first, I'd like to talk about the rise of direct mobile traffic versus Facebook. So what's really starting to happen is, uh, unlike uh, last year, uh, where Facebook sort of was the highest referrer um, of mobile-specific traffic, followed by direct, followed by search. So you see the blue line, the green line, and the red line. We've seen a reversal um, of the two platforms, and I've talked about that earlier. But the direct line in green, which is represented by, um, this, is, this is consumers who type in the URL and go directly to either a mobile website or an app. There are now more consumers doing that than there are consumers getting, coming to publisher sites via Facebook. Um, and that's huge. That's put a lot of power back in the hands of publishers. In Europe, incidentally, direct traffic has always been higher than either platform referred traffic. Um, but in countries like Australia, the Latin American countries, and in the US, that's not true. Uh, so this return um, to direct traffic um, is empowering, and it's something that we need to leverage. It's also 
important to understand that the traffic that's coming from platforms um, is one-time traffic, but it may not be loyal. Um, so what we're, what we're seeing is that uh, when we look at loyalty, there's a different picture that's painted. We see that app visitors are 5.7 times more loyal than visitors from platforms. And what's fascinating and what's actually quite honestly a huge surprise is that, that mobile visitors are actually more loyal than visitors on desktop. Uh, we just pulled this data about 60 days ago and we quite honestly couldn't believe it. The stereotype is that if you're on your mobile device, you're consuming news quickly, you're skimming, you're not reading deep. But what we're seeing is that actually readership on mobile devices is almost exactly similar to reading behavior on the desktop device. On the desktop, you scroll about three quarters down the page. On a mobile device, readers only scroll about 25% down the page. However, readers on mobile spend a lot more time with content, uh, and, um, and they're also 20% more likely to click on links and visit your site than they are from desktop. Um, and when we look at loyalty here, this is the number of visits that someone's most likely to return in a week. We see that regardless of the channel that a reader is on, they're actually more loyal um, on a mobile device than on desktop. Uh, so th this is really interesting insight uh, to, to all of us. Um, and you also see on here that uh, deep link and push at 6.6, um, that push notifications is also driving uh, and is a secret weapon in the portfolio of publishers in driving loyalty. So if you're a business that's trying to drive subscriptions, um, or you're looking at your investments, how much should my editorial team be investing in traffic driving and measurement around Facebook or Google search or Twitter versus in my owned and operated platforms? This information is really significant. So because of all of this, um, you know, we know so far that uh, that the platform world is changing, that mobile is more important, that the mobile landscape is actually composed of three different layers, platforms, aggregators, and your owned and operated sites, um, and that, that readers are actually more loyal. Um, they're, they're very inclined to go direct these days. Um, so it's sort of painting a picture of really what would the world look like without Facebook? Um, are we starting to see indications of a post-platform world? Um, and, you know, a lot of the publishers that we work with have been imagining this for a while. Um, little did we know that we'd actually get the chance to observe this in action when Facebook crashed. So Facebook crashed on August 3rd, uh, and they were down for 45 minutes. So what happened to news consumption? Complete dip. So does anyone remember how, what percentage of traffic Facebook drives to publishers from my earlier slide? It's about 15%, 15%. So you'd expect traffic to publishers to drop 15% if Facebook was down, right? Wrong. Traffic to publishers, direct traffic to publishers went up 11% and traffic to, um, traffic to apps, was up 22% and traffic to search was up 8%. So all of this actually lifted total traffic by 2.3%. Uh, so what happened when Facebook went down? Consumers went and read the news. They actually visited publishers' sites. Um, and it's just fascinating because what this is telling us is, you know, I was talking about addiction earlier. News used to be addictive. We used to read the paper as part of our routine. Now people are addicted to their phones. Are they addicted to their phones? Are they addicted to content? Um, if in a second Facebook can go down and people can change their behavior, um, that's just fascinating. That actually means that the phone could actually be the, the source of the addiction and not Facebook. Um, and what happens if we find newer and better um, and more innovative ways 
uh, to give people options to interact with content. Um, incidentally, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but YouTube went down last week. If you want to know what happened there, go and read our blog post, blog.chartbeat.com. I don't have it in the deck. Uh, but guess what happened? People went and read the news. Traffic to publishers went up 20% last week when YouTube went down for an hour. Fascinating. And it happened in a second. Half of the traffic going to publishers during the YouTube outage was, to, was basically just, um, driven by search. A lot of people actually asking the question, why is YouTube down? Because it was never down. Um, that was 11, about 10%, but the other 10% was net new traffic to publishers. Um, but we're starting to see this post-Facebook world, um, this, this post-platform world. Um, and um, it's just fascinating to, to think about what could really happen if we put our heads together and thought of other business models. Um, but it, talks, it also shows how fickle consumers really are um, and how open they are to change. Okay, so that leads us to the second part of my talk. Uh, all of this talk of platforms has us wondering then really how are publishers thinking about their business because obviously you, all of these platform issues are not in your control. Um, it's one thing to understand the data around it and to have analytics around it. Um, and to try to manage it every day. Uh, but there has to be a better way that you can build your audience and grow. Um, so really looking ahead, um, you know, what we're seeing is that people need data. And data and an understanding of not just how they connect to the rest of the ecosystem, but of, of how consumers are reading their own content is critically important. Um, and now's really the time for people to think about data. Um, according to the Reuters Institute study um, that came out earlier this year, uh, when asked what the most important initiatives are for 2018, uh, publishers said improving data capacity in orange, they're the first bar. Um, understanding mobile notifications, the blue bar. And getting data registrations either from your website users or your app users um, were critical investments, followed by really optimizing content for social and search, right? So all of these are data considerations uh, and um, they're critically important. But how you approach growth, unlike platforms which are elusive, um, it doesn't have to be complicated. You heard Lucy speak earlier, you've heard um, quite a few of our speakers talk about the importance of data. Um, but what's most important is knowing your brand. You have to know your brand, you have to know your voice, um, and you have to know how to sift through the data and get at what is critical. Um, and, um, and you have to know what KPI you want, you want to align your organization around. Um, so understanding that, putting that strategy in place, um, taking that strategy and aligning the right insights to it, but then empowering your newsroom to take action every day and enabling them to refine and learn uh, is critical. So we, we call this cycle the audience growth cycle. And at Chartbeat, we build tools for users in the newsroom who can sort of take the complexity that exists in an analytics department um, and um, kind of boil it down into actions that they could take every day. Um, so I want to just share a few examples with you of how um, some of our customers are using data in the newsroom to grow their audience. Okay, the first one is the BBC Korea. Uh, the BBC Korea uh, acknowledges that they live in a world that is dominated by neighbor. Um, but even so, uh, they use Chartbeat every day uh, to understand um, their audience. This is not their dashboard, by the way. Um, because we're, we don't share our customers' data. This is just a mock-up. Um, but what I can tell you is that uh, they've made the decision to pull a to use the Chartbeat reports every day. So th they start their morning meeting every day with a report from yesterday. Um, with Chartbeat, what, what you can understand is uh, 
who's reading your content. Uh, you can understand which content is being read by desktop and mobile. You can understand what's being read um, in Korea, and they also have a North Korea filter um, and um, in other parts of the world. Um, you, um, you can also look at your subscribers. You can look at new visitors versus loyal versus subscribers and understand if the articles that, they're, that are being read are different. And you can also look uh, at um, the refer channels um, and um, what percentage of your tra traffic is coming in um, from search versus social versus Google, et cetera. Uh, and, um, you know, this, they, you know, I think one of the first lessons is start your day with data, start every day with insights. Um, they look at our reports, which come in on either the mobile device um, or, um, uh, or desktop. Uh, they, they get emailed to you. Um, and they really think about what did they learn yesterday? Was there a story that, uh, that got specific traction? Was there a spike alert? That, did Naver send a dramatic spike uh, to the BBC Korea? Um, that they needed to pay attention to. And over time, you start to understand what your editorial voice is, if the context you're building around your articles is resonating, um, and whether or not you're hitting the same audience over time. Um, and so the editor who, who I was talking to um, said that, it, that it's really useful just to boil down the complexity of analytics to just one action, and that's starting every day with data. Okay, the next case study I want to talk about is, uh, is Rumi, which is a lifestyle brand in Japan that's owned by MediaGene. Uh, so uh, this brand in Japan and a variety of the MediaGene brands, including Digiday, who you may have heard of, uh, were always given the task from their executive team to build page views. They wanted to build page views. They wanted to be, build readers over time. Uh, but when they discovered Chartbeat, uh, something changed. Um, what our platform enables you to do is um, not just build page views and clicks. All of our analytics are optimized to engage time. Um, our platform, the whole reason why we built the platform was to fight against clickbait. So all of our analytics take into consideration um, human readership. Um, our, the JavaScript on the page understands movement and idle state so that we can understand whether someone's actually really reading or whether they're idle. Um, so um, everything from the headline tests that we enable to the engaged time that we measure lets people understand uh, engagement with content. Um, and this is transformative. Um, so they, they use Chartbeat and um, they were able to uh, not just build visitors, but they were going for repeat users. Because what engagement, what we know about engagement, which is represented in this chart, is that if you can get someone to engage for more than 15 seconds, they're almost twice as likely to return than if they read for less than 15 seconds. And the longer they stay on your site, up to 300 seconds, you see a, a um, 125 seconds, you see a huge spike, 300 seconds, you see, a, you, you see an even higher propensity to return. Um, the longer someone spends on your site the first time they're there, and every time after that, the more likely they are to come back. And engagement is the metric that helps you understand this. So if you could figure out how to prioritize engagement in your day-to-day -day routine, um, you can build loyalty. Um, and um, so they were able to um, install Chartbeat, and um, it helped their content teams grow repeat users to the site by 40%. And then my last case study is South China Morning Post from Hong Kong. So South China Morning Post is growing their audience, and uh, they're very interested in how the news that they write reaches not just the English language audience, but also the local audience in Hong Kong, um, and um, as well as the international audience. And they're trying to, um, to think very carefully about how they uh, they look at their editorial strategy by different readers and reader types. Um, so they, they started with, Chartbeat has a headline testing tool, and unlike any other testing tool out there, uh, it, the measurement system works on engaged clicks, which means that it measures the success of a headline test based on not just if someone clicked on the headline, but did they click and read for at least 15 seconds? 
So the whole A-B test is geared towards ensuring that someone's actually reading after they click on the headline. Um, and what we're seeing, this is just one example, but um, Dallas Morning News just wrote an article uh, a couple weeks ago about their use of Chart Beats headline testing. 30% growth in readership um, of their articles in one week. And this, this has pretty much become the average once someone starts using the head, te headline testing tool. And it's fascinating because headlines are the art of writing. They're the art of journalism. But um, what we've done with this tool, it was based on um, mach a machine learning, um, a natural language processing study that we did with Cornell Tech to really understand if there were certain words that actually mattered and impacted the success of a headline. Um, and so the product was built with that in mind. And um, we are able to show that if you test your headlines, um, you really can grow your audience and technology can augment the art of journalism. Um, and this is really because, uh, you know, even, even based on time of day, your article could, it, could, the news could change, you could learn more facts, you could be expanding um, the context of the story and wanting to really change that headline, but um, you know, 62% of the time that headline tests are run, the second headline wins. So South China Morning Post now um, has changed their culture. They make every journalist come um, with their story with two headlines, and they test their headlines um, religiously now every day, um, and um, it's changed their culture. It's given them a much better handle um, on exploration around their voice and their angle, and, um, and we're really excited to see these results. So just in summary and to wrap up, um, I'd just like to say that you know it may not be a post-platform world completely, um, but it's definitely shaping up to be a post-Facebook world, at least for those of us in the West. Um, and we are seeing that consumers are starting to show signs of substitutive, substitutive behavior. Substitutive behavior, behavior, meaning that they can substitute at any time um, an activity that they're doing on a platform with something else if given um, the convenience and the speed and a similar user experience. Um, so um, we're also seeing that while Facebook is declining, Google is growing in strength. So what does this mean? What does this mean for regulation? What does this mean for what publishers and newsrooms need to do to invest in uh, search optimization um, in terms of getting your articles listed on Google search so that consumers can discover them and find them easily? Um, we're also seeing that direct audiences are more loyal than we thought. Um, they will go and seek out the news when they need to. And you know, in Korea, that may not be happening as, as easily as you would like. Um, in the West, especially in the US right now, where we're in a, um, a dire political environment um, and trust is down, we're seeing that the ease that a platform can fall out of favor, um, it's just becoming easier and easier. Um, and, um, and you must invest in your brands and you must invest in your direct audiences. Um, and you have a new toolbox in your push alerts and in your mobile apps. Um, and um, there's nothing holding you back if you think about the update example. Um, of building any, a new innovative business model um, that lives on the device. Um, we're also seeing strength in uh, Chrome and also in tech, uh, in the mobile uh, phone operators, um, the device makers and um, the operating system makers like Samsung and Apple. Um, and um, I think we could pose the question, it'd be interesting to look back next year and see if they've if they've grown in traction. Um, and then finally, um, you know, how can, you know, you, you can't really control what's going on with platforms, but you can control day to day in your newsroom, how you build and grow your audience and how you drive traffic to your site. Um, and that starts with really understanding your strategy and your KPIs and using data actively every day. Start your morning with reports. Understand how people are reading your content. Test things, test your page layout, test your headlines, um, and focus on engagement. 
Um, engagement really is the truest indication um, of success uh, that, that we see across the 50,000 sites and 700 major companies that we work with. Um, the more people engage with content, the longer they spend with your brand and your voice and your journalism. The longer they spend with that content, the more ads can appear. Or if you're a subscriber, the more loyalty you're building, or both. Um, and that's really, really important. So those everyday actions with data um, can help you uh, grow your audience. Uh, so now it's really up to you. Is it a post-platform world? I don't know. I don't think so with Naver in Korea. Um, but hopefully uh, you have some ideas from this presentation um, of, um, of steps that you can take and a little bit of hope um, that anything can change at any time. Um, and it's really important that you believe in your brands um, and you believe in journalism. Thank you. Thank you. 좋은 강연해 주신 테리 월터 CMO님 감사드립니다. 자 이제 Q&A 세션으로 넘어가겠는데요. 첫 번째 질문 보시겠습니다. 한국 언론사들이 외면하고 있는 분야가 독자 분석이라고 생각합니다. 독자 분석을 위해 철 비트에 관심이 생겼는데 BBC 코리아 외에 철비트를 이용하는 한국 언론사가 있는지 구글 애널리틱스와는 어떤 차이가 있는지 궁금합니다. 다음 질문으로 넘어가도록 하겠습니다. 언론사 직접 방문이 아닌 여러 가지 유형의 플랫폼들, SNS, 검색 엔진, 뉴스 에그리게이터 등을 격려하는 트래픽의 경우 페이스북, 구글, 삼성 등 1등 미디어 기업이 바뀔 뿐 높은 비율로 유지되고 있습니다. 얼마 전까지는 페이스북의 뉴스 피드 정책이 조금만 바뀌어도 언론사들은 그에 대응하기 위해 분주했고 페이스북 경유 트래픽이 줄어든 지금은 구글, 삼성 등 다른 미디어 기업의 영향이 늘었을 뿐 플랫폼 전체의 영향력은 변함이 없다 할수 있습니다. 언론사들은 그저 트래픽이 많이 발생하는 플랫폼이 무엇인지 지속적으로 파악하고 그에 적극적으로 대응하는 종속적 입장을 유지해야 하는 것일까요? I hope I understand the question correctly, but um, I think that uh, platforms are all different. The amount of traffic they drive to each publisher is actually different. Uh, it, there, there are certain news organizations, for example, that, uh, that are heavy in search by nature of the type of content they publish, and others uh, that are heavy on social. Uh, so I think the secret is really data and understanding data Uh, I mean, Chartbeat's integrated with, uh, with Facebook, Facebook Instant Articles, we have integrations with AMP, we have integrations with local platforms around the world, Smart News, uh, et cetera. Um, and, um, but, I mean, you have a distributed content landscape that is so difficult to understand. And you have a platform, you know, let's, let's take Google. Uh, Google's made all of these algorithm shifts Uh, with, and hasn't really told anyone about their shifts. Uh, the news is, at least where in the U.S., has been focused on all of the shifts in, that Facebook is making. Uh, so there's a lot that we can all learn 
uh, about each of these platforms because they all operate differently. Um, the most important thing is is trying to get uh, ha put, have be educated as as well as you can, um, follow the trends, um, read the news, um, and and try to understand them as much as possible. If you have a newsroom where you have a certain reporter that is your, your social media editor or that is your, your search editor, um, which, which is, happens in the West, uh, a lot of newsrooms have their social media editor or their social editor that used to be on the marketing team. Now they're part of the editorial team or in smaller publications, they are the editorial team. Um, so the models just vary and they're, they're very different from publication to publication. Um, but just most important thing, get as smart as you can. Um, there's nothing like the power of data to not just educate yourself and make your business better, but also, you know, we use our data to impact Google and Facebook, when we put this, these trends out and this news out, they call us and complain. <laughs> so that just shows that um, you know, using data both every day and then also uh, the power of collective insight and pressure is really important. 네, 마지막 질문 보도록 하겠습니다. 흥미로운 내용이 많아서 유익했습니다. 감사합니다. 혹시 앱, 애플 iOS를 사용하는 유저들의 뉴스 사용 습관과 구글 안드로이드 유저들의 습관이 다르다면 어떻게 다른지 궁금합니다. 예, 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 First off, uh, Google, the Android users, uh, Android is um, pretty much the main platform in Europe and rest of world, Apple in the US. Uh, the, um, the Apple News app is fairly new, uh, and um, Apple's taken a, a different approach to working with news organizations than Google has, uh, which is different from, from Facebook. Um, in both cases, uh, they're both very uh, understanding and uh, sympathetic to news organizations. Um, Apple is taking a, uh, a slower approach to that ecosystem. In terms of the users of the iOS um, uh, in Apple and Google, um, all you need to really do is look at the apps uh, on on the phones. I'd be happy to show you if you want to come up afterwards um, we, to look at, new, at how um, Apple News works versus Google News. Um, there, Apple has human editors who are choosing the news, and they're operating very much like uh, a normal news organization in terms of um, what stories they pick, and that influences the consumer and how they use um, that, that system. Uh, it also has personalization built in. Um, Google News is also brand new, totally reinvented. Um, and um, you know that's that's it. Both of them pre-installed on the device, um, and um, in the case of Google, also accessible on desktop. Um, so slightly different experiences, the same idea, um, and um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how they both develop. <laughs>